Welcome back to Job Math, the podcast for Gen Z professionals. I'm Dale. And I'm Lisa. This podcast is for you if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want. Today, we are lifting the lid on careers in software, engineering, and technology career paths. Our guest today has held many coveted positions, including VP of Engineering and Head of Securities roles across multiple organizations. Someone who, as we like to say, has been there, seen it, and done it all. So, we are joined today by our distinguished guest, Mike. Can you please introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Uh, thanks, Lisa and Dale, for having me. Um, Mike Rowan, uh, VP of Engineering. Um, my uh, background has been a software engineer um, throughout most of my career, and then also uh, got involved in security and infrastructure and, and DevOps and all that good stuff. So, um, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic to have you, Mike. So we normally kick off with a bit of background. So can you give us a summary about where you grew up, a bit about your education and your step to step uh, or your steps towards being that VP of engineering? Sure, I'll try to keep it brief. It's been 25 years. So uh, we'll, we'll try and summarize it for y'all. Um, grew up in uh, New York, uh, New York State, outside of New York City, um, small town, uh, and then went to University of Maryland at College Park uh, for CS. Um, actually originally started as a mechanical engineer and very quickly realized that was not the right career path for me. So switched into computer science, uh, graduated from there uh, and joined, um, actually started working before I graduated uh, at a professional services company called Proxima uh, that actually, and this is the dot-com era. So they ended up going IPO and it was a great experience for me. Um, my first job entry level um, and then worked as a software engineer in various roles and companies. Um, professional services, government services, on-site, on, you know, at the government, um, product development, um, so on and so forth, ended up in enterprise software, um, and then also on platforms and uh, SaaS platforms as well. Um, so sort of been there uh, and ended up, um, you know, sort of moving up, uh, starting as a senior engineer at a startup um, and was hired to help build the engineering practice there. And that was where I really moved up from, um, you know, sort of senior engineer to director to engineering manager to VP of engineering and, and head of security. Um, and then kept that going to uh, the next couple of companies. Um, so yeah, wealth of experience. <laughs> awesome. And so you've talked about some of those different roles. Can you maybe, within a software development or software engineering team, tell us a little bit about those different types of roles and maybe why people would like some or maybe not like some of the others? Yeah, I mean, the I think the biggest like distinction I would say between like product development versus um, services, right? Like those are two big different things. Um, the advantages to product development is you're generally working on the same thing and you can really take ownership. You get in the mindset of the end user. You can really see how what you're doing is connected to this, this product. And it's, there's a consistency that really goes with that, that I, that I really like, I really like product development um, services, whether it's professional services or government services, those tend to be, you know, short stints, project oriented, um, you're going in, you're solving a problem and moving on. Um, that's also kind of satisfying as well. You're constantly learning new technologies. Um, you're solving new problems. Um, I've worked as both um, pre and post sales engineer, um, doing like systems integration. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, cool things that come from that. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. You can move back and forth between those two things. I, I certainly have over the course of my career. But um, if you like, con you know, sort of a little bit, of, if you don't mind change or enjoy change and, and like doing new things, services is a great way to do that. Um, it gives you a lot of exposure to lots of things. Product development is a little more, you know, steady paced and um, you get it. You actually get an opportunity to go back and refactor and do all those like, oh, you know, really see something build. Um, and scale over time in a way that I don't think you get to see in, in services. So th those would be the two big distinctions, I would say. How would you advise people who want to follow in your subsets, who want to be in, a, in, in an engineering role? Or maybe, uh, maybe before that, maybe just um, describe maybe any of the pros and cons of some of the types of organizations that you mentioned before. Like, what did you enjoy or what might people like about one thing or the other? Build yeah, sure. Comments on that? Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, I mean, I think... 
when I think about, especially early in my career, that's where I did a lot of the professional services. My very first job was actually at a product. We were doing a product within a professional services organization. So it was a little, I got a little bit of both. It was a very highly customizable product. Like that was sort of the, the idea was we have this thing uh, that we can sell, but it's customizable. And then there's services on top of that. And it was sort of a potentially a foot in the door with some of these larger organizations. And it was a great experience. Um, you get to work directly with clients, um, which some people, that's a con. Like it's, it's really up to your personality. Um, do you like working? <laughs> do, you, do you enjoy talking to clients and hearing unreasonable expectations and sort of navigating all that? Or, or don't you? Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think that there's – putting it in terms of pros and cons, I think it really comes down to your personality. What do you enjoy doing? Um, on the services side, you're just dealing – you're usually interfacing directly with clients. Um, and projects, um, whereas product development, you're usually interfacing with the product team and they're running interference for you. And um, it's less about project management. Um, I think that's very appealing to a lot of people. Um, but I would say that I got a lot of great experiences out of the services side and really working with clients and, and understanding the, the end user perspectives of things. Um, so it's hard to say it in terms of pros and cons. Um, and I have a quick question about yeah, sure. that. Uh, do you think you knew at the start or as you were launching into those jobs, which ones you would like, or do you think you have developed over time and been able to pick based on what you're feeling at the moment or in the stages of your career, what makes sense for you? Um, I definitely didn't know at the time. So let me, I mean, maybe that's a good story. It's like, how did I get my first job? Um, cause I think it's, it's, that's how did I get all of my jobs? Almost all, um, with one or two exceptions has been through like serendipity, not through like a direct, like targeted, like, this is what I want to do. Um, so my very first job, it was, um, I was at the computer lab at Maryland, um, working on a CS project. Um, one of my friends was also there. Uh, we decided to take a break um, and, and hop in his car to go to lunch. And he was telling me about, oh, over the summer, he has this opportunity. So, you know, there's a Maryland grad who's hiring a couple engineers um, and he's going to go interview for. And um, as we're driving through the parking lot, that the, per the hiring manager, manager, uh, happened to be walking through the parking lot because he was it turns out he was actually also still a student at the university of maryland um and so i think he might have been a grad student um in any event so we sort of bumped into him in the parking lot and my friend dave was like oh hey Ke you know i think his name was kevin hey kevin uh see you on monday or whatever for the interview and kevin's like blah 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 and then kevin basically invited me to come along on my friend dave's interview so i was like oh awesome so i just went with dave on his <laughs> job interview <laughs> And uh, and uh, I was asked to like code up a linked list live. Uh, I started Wait doing it. I didn't even have to get very far on it because it was clear I knew what I was doing. I was like, okay, first thing you need is this. And then Kevin was like, all right, you, you clearly know what you're doing. Um, and that's how I got my first job. Um, I had no idea what I was interviewing for, or what I was getting into, but I knew I needed. I wanted to stay down in Maryland for the summer. Um, I had an apartment uh, that I needed to pay for, um, and so it just sort of worked out. Um, and then that's sort of how things went. My second job was through my friends network. Um, I was leaving that company, um, and some friends of mine were at this other company and they were like, you could, you should come over here. And so I did. Um, and that took a few months, actually. I met with the CEO. It was a very small software boutique type company. They didn't want to necessarily bring on lots of engineers. They were building very slowly. They wanted to make sure that they did it right. Um, but yeah, that's how I got that job. And then it's sort of, that's how I've gotten a lot of them. So it's been less about like, oh, I want to do this. Um, I think um, towards as I got further in my career and I had more experiences, yeah, there was a point where I was like, I definitely want to do have this experience. And like, for example, I never worked at a really large financial company, like one of these big whatever. So I went and took one of the, you know, I looked and, and took one of those opportunities and learned very quickly that that was not the right job for me. Um, and then, um, and really like liked working on products and doing product development. And so now later in my career, I know that's really where I want to spend my time. I really enjoy that. I don't enjoy as much the, the services side of this. Um, so, but yeah, I didn't know early on. Um, and I think, I don't think anybody does. I think, and things change over time. Um, you can, I think it's just good to get different experiences and, and be in different roles. Like I, I started off as a, you know, my very first job, I was writing install software it was all, well, my very, like, 
first we were writing C, CGIs, and then Java. Um, I was writing the install software and doing configuration management. It was very, like, behind the scenes. Um, and then, um, you know, I had other opportunities to play other roles, whether it was DBA, um, because there was a need on a team for that later in my career. I, you know, there was sort of this need. Or... Um, working on the front end and realizing once again like yeah i suck at the front end like if you want a really bad front end by all means hire me to do it um just because i don't have the, a good eye for that um and so i you know i definitely recommend that people take on different look for those opportunities i mean it doesn't have to be a new job it can be within the company you're at looking for those opportunities to sort of get some experiences and identify what what you really enjoy doing um I still think of I, I worked with a front end developer. Um, she just came right out of a boot camp um, doing front end, and um, she she had expressed some interest in doing back end, and we were a little skeptical because she wasn't the strongest front end developer, um, and so we were sort of a, you know a little concerned. But it turned out she was amazing. Like it just like we gave her that opportunity, and she learned it, and she started building. And I would say that she became a really, really good, like mid tier back end engineer. Um, and I'm glad that she said, like, I'm, I'm interested in trying this. I don't know if it's for me, but um, I want to try this. Um, and so I think, you know, I'd encourage everybody to sort of look for those opportunities. Cool. Thanks, Mike. This is really interesting. Um, so maybe, maybe just to, for the uninitiated, when we're talking about professional services, what we're talking about is working at a consultancy or an agency, sometimes known as a systems integrator. Um, so brands might be companies like, I guess, Capgemini, IBM, Accenture, to, to, to name Accenture, a few. Yeah. We're not endorsing or, or, or otherwise those types of companies, but, um, but th those are the types of companies we're talking about when we talk about professional services versus working internally in, in a software engineering team for, for directly for a company. Is right. those, those two things we're talking about there, uh, just in case people weren't clear on that. And then there's plenty. Um, I, I do want to jump in because within yeah. uh, a lot of product companies, there are professional services teams whose responsibility is to take the software and, that they then the, internally have built and getting it integrated and deployed into a larger ecosystem. So there's also opportunities to be working at a traditionally product company, but doing in their pro professional services or customer service or systems integrations uh, teams. Um, similarly, some of those large companies you just mentioned that are doing consultancy, they do have like reusable product groups and product teams within them where they're building reusable products that sort of that foot in the door, like, hey, we'll sell this. Like Oracle is a good example. They have like products, but they have a ton of services. And so it's hard to classify them as one or the other. Um, IBM, similar. Got it. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks for giving that, that bit of detail. That's great. And so you, you talked about maybe mentoring this um, team member. Like, what's your advice for people maybe starting their career in software engineering? You talked about the, the sort of pros and cons of front end, back end. We're going to hear things like full stack, I think, come into, into this conversation <laughs> shortly by uh, uh, our conversation last week. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump in there, and then uh, yeah, and then I've got a follow up for you. Nah, um, I mean I, it's it's just interesting over the course of you know like to me, full stack has really does mean sort of the because we've added all of this abstraction, we've created an an, an environment where it is easier for people to um, build applications and 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 be full stack without really knowing like the infrastructure side of things to me when i first started my career like full stack really was everything from front end all the way through deployment infrastructure actually like deploying on hardware and there were very few people i would say um who would classify who i classify as being able to do that um and so i always kind of scoff a little bit in my in, because i'm a snob uh about the idea of a full stack uh but the fact is you can build a whole application these days and know mostly front end, a little bit of mid tier, just that glue between, and and be a little dangerous with some SQL and and being able to connect with a database or even a NoSQL database, you know, NoSQL store. Um, but anyway, that's that's a whole other thing. Um, so people starting off in their career, I mean, it's hard to say. Um, I think you know, you try and figure out what you enjoy doing. Um, 
especially in this market right now, it's really tough to get in, right? There's not a lot of entry level positions. Um, I talk to people all the time, um, especially a lot of like younger siblings of some of my friends or some of my friends because I'm old enough uh, whose kids are trying to get into software engineering. Um, and, you know, the the common theme of, oh, this is an entry level position, but they want me to have five years of experience. Like, I, I don't understand. Um, and so how do I how do I do that? And um, it is tricky, but my advice would be, first of all, you know, experiment, tinker, and, and, and do things on your own to try and figure out where in the stack your entry point is. Like, the over the course of your career, um, what I sort of tell engineers or what I look for are T-shaped engineers. So by that, I mean, you sort of start somewhere and you go deep and then you start broadening your your abilities, but you're still a specialist in certain areas. So for me, it's to figure out what what thing interests you the most. Start there, go deep on that, and then and then start branching out and looking for ways to experiment to do other things. I started off in configuration management and Java and backend, and then that's what led me into um integrations and infrastructure and cybersecurity and all these other sort of paths where, you know, I would still, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert, um, like broadly, but I have some, some capabilities and expertise and knowledge. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of T-shaped. So if you're starting off, if you're sort of artsy, start in, you know, on the front end and on design and, and on building really, you know, exciting web apps or even web pages or, or whatever it is and, and just start going deeper and deeper um, if that's your thing. Um, you know, um, so that, that would be my advice. And it's, as I said, right now, it's really tricky to get a job. Um, so I would, I would first, first thing is get, get that foot in the door, right? Don't, um, I would say, try and go broad, try and find a, just try and find that job, use your network, um, to, to get that job. I mean, I, I think if you've gone to college, take advantage of that college network. That's how I got my first job. Um, I think it's still true today. Um, there's there's a lot of alumni and other people who are looking to help you um, get started. Great. So so we've talked about a lot of reasons why it's challenging in this world today. Uh, so to add a layer to that, our favorite topic here of AI. How do you see AI impacting either the industry as a whole, any of these types of jobs, your jobs, um, anything related to AI, obviously, <laughs> as a big engineering component into it. So what was your take there? I mean, my take, I mean, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think I'm um, going out on a limb here. I think AI is like anything, it's a tool. Um, I look at the history of everything in software engineering, right? When I started um, back a long, long time ago, we didn't have we didn't have hardly anything, right? And like, so the barrier of entry for an engineer or for anyone to get into software engineering was really, really high. Like we, we had to do a lot of things. And then we had, you know, we had designers and we had um, graphic artists and we had all of these like individual specialists who really helped us with things. And then we, we as an industry, software engineers, like we like to solve problems and automate things and we create abstractions and abstractions and abstractions to the point now where on my, um, a couple companies ago, one of the people on the team, he had an art background. Like that was his, he went to art school. Um, he started with web pages and then started learning how to do some JavaScript and what he was able to do now was so much more like the barrier of entry has just come way down right whereas in the past he would have never really been able to build a web application because it was such a high barrier and i guess my point is ai is just another like it's just another step on that it's really just going to make it easier and easier for more and more people to do things um and people who are currently outside of application development to come within application development um certainly that does have a threatening aspect to people who are in the role. That means that there's going to be sort of less need for software engineers, maybe. Um, but at the same time, it might, you know, what you work on, you know, we're like who builds the, the AI, like there's still, you know, eventually AI will build the AI and then there'll be the AI singularity and blah, 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 blah. But in the meantime, I think there's still, you know, there's still a lot going on there. Um, 
and AI is a tool. Um, it doesn't replace us. It's um, where I worry the most is that I'll, so much of what I learned early in my career was from doing what AI is going to be able to do, that entry level, that early stuff. And now people are going to be debugging, you know, like the main job is going to be debugging a lot of the code that it sort of generates and looking at it and figuring out how to make it more efficient. And you're not going to have that experience. Like, that takes experience to do that. And how do you get that experience? It's, it's that same problem. So um, I think that's where I'm a little concerned is the entry level positions kind of disappearing and making it really, really hard for people to get to that next step after, you know, really working with AI. And we sort of see it in DevOps. Um, I know a lot of um, more senior DevOps people who, who had to deploy actual ser servers and actually understand how networking, like how plugging in the cables actually works and the TCP IP stack and the rest of it. Now there's more and more tools and abstraction where it's been the curve down so more and more people can do it, but there's still this huge gap of knowledge between between the most experienced and these people. And it's it's um it's tough to bridge that gap because there's just not that many opportunities to work on that that problem space because it's kind of been automated and hidden away, um, but they still break and you still need that experience. So it's a, that's where I think it's, it's a little concerning about AI, but not like, I'm not overly concerned. I think it's just going to allow more people to do more faster. Like that's, I think uh, what computers do. Um. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you're recommending that blend of use it as a helpful tool, but don't neglect that at some point there, currently there might be a problem that you just need that experience for so if you're trying to enter this field do both right learn right. how to use it as a tool but learn how to actually understand it yourself as well right don't, right. don't try to skip that part yeah yeah no definitely understanding it and i think that's the biggest thing that's happening right now is um the you can't just use the code that comes straight out you have to understand it you have to actually change it um there's legal ramifications like understand some of the like the ip and copyright um, aspects of it or you don't necessarily have to understand all of it but just do do be aware that like what you're doing with ai there's a lot of uh legal um and copyright open questions that still need to be resolved but they need to work that. Enough enough. exactly <laughs> i mean like there's nothing more exciting than intellectual property law um i mean actually i, I kind of enjoy it if uh if it wasn't for the barrier of entry of going to law school it's probably something i would have looked into <laughs> or <laughs> pursued <laughs> Well, if you're an IP lawyer and want to come on to the uh, to the Job Math podcast, you know where to find us, guys. Come in and give us your hot takes on on the impact of AI on on IP. Uh, I, I think you're right, Mike. It's, it's there's going to be a hot mess somewhere along the road, um, and probably quite a lot of money for IP lawyers uh, to make on, on one side or the other. I mean, other. that's the nice thing is there's always a lot of money for lawyers to be made. So. Uh... <laughs> I mean, if I was a conspiracy theorist, I would say that's the main reason for technology companies to exist is, is to is to is to make money for lawyers. But you know, difficult to dis disprove. <laughs> um, uh, great. Um, so we talked about advice for for many people in in the early careers. Um, you've hired people and and, and built teams. Um, maybe talk about. Um, so there's a question we ask often ask people. What are your job application or job interview icks or red flags? What should people be leaving out of their application, avoiding saying interview? Um, uh, what I like to see, I think I, I try to think about it more in terms of like the what I like seeing, and then I can think about it from a negative. Yeah, but, give, give, give us a positive first, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. then we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll so, reverse engineer it. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, what I'm looking for is, um, you know, especially in the entry level, like I, I know that you don't know, right? Like. But what I want is a little bit of a, a sense of like whether it's in the in a summer, you know, in a in an objective statement. Um, I definitely look for someone who's not just looking for what the company can do for them, but rather also looking at sort of suggesting what skills they have that they can apply, even if it's not. It, you know, and, and especially entry level, it's not going to be tech skills, right? It could be problem solving, it could be writing skills, it could be whatever it is, but make it clear to me that this isn't just, oh, I'm looking for a job because I want you guys to pay me money or, you know, or whatever. Like I'm looking for like, you know, I'm looking for an opportunity where I can apply my problem solving skills or my, you know, blah, blah, blah to this. Um, and I think it's kind of a red flag when I don't see that because I do think then the person is, you know, 
I, I think back to um, a couple companies ago, I worked with this um, a CFO and he would say all the time, like, are you playing for the name on the front of the jersey or the name on the back of the jersey? And I want people that are playing for the name on the front. Um, I, you know, as opposed to the people, especially at a startup, um, the name on the back of the jersey, that's, that's, you know, and so that's some of the, so make sure that you're sort of casting yourself as that team player, that collaborative person. That's what I'm looking for. Um, and that's, that's a lot of what I'm looking for at any role. Forget about um, early, late, whatever. What I'm, what I'm looking for in any applicant are, are you open minded? Um, are you self aware? And are you a problem solver? Um, you give me those things, that means that you're going to be coachable um, because you're open-minded and self-aware. You know what you, by self-aware, I mean, you know what you know and you know what you don't know. And I think that gets into some of the X factors. Don't try and bullshit me. Like, be honest. Like, say, I don't know. Cool. Sometimes I'll follow that up with, okay, cool. Like, especially if you're moving on in the interview process, if you don't know the answer to something, I might be like, okay, that's cool. Next time we talk, like, you know, whatever, like, it's always awesome when that person comes back for that second round and is like, oh, you know, you, we brought up this thing on the blah, blah, blah call. I looked into it and it turns out that this is how that works or this is how I'd solve that problem. Like, that's always awesome to me. Like, you, you actually took that initiative. Um, but anyway, so open minded, self aware, problem solver. Those are the three things I look for. Everything else, um, your experience, the, the technologies you know, those types of things, I have no doubt that a smart person can learn new technology. Like, that's, it's not that hard. It's, they're just, the, it's, it's the same things, just a different library, different API, different whatever. I have no doubt that somebody can learn that um, if they have the right sort of qualities. And so for me, the, soft stuff is what gets you the job the experience and skills is what lets me figure out what how much i should be paying you um if if that makes sense so you're not getting in the door if you're not if you don't have those those qualities and i've met plenty of what i would qualify as senior engineers lacking experience meaning they have the right mindset they have the right approach to problem solving problem um they're they're pragmatic in their approach um but they just don't have those years of experience yet okay cool come we'll get you those those years of experience and you're going to be there's no doubt in my mind that you're going to grow into a senior engineer that's what i'm looking for yeah i love the uh lovely also um yeah i like that you're um bringing up the the people aspect right we've been talking a lot about these are technical roles and we have technical skills, but still there are people and we're still managing teams. So those soft skills, people skills that bridge, yes, you can technically do the thing, but what's going to make you a good worker or a team right. member is that you're also human and, and you, <laughs> and, and, and you, that you treat other people like humans, right. right? And you treat yeah. other people like humans. Like that's, that's an important thing. And that's a lot of the stuff that goes on in the interview process for me is looking at how, like, um, how comfortable are you? Like when I ask you questions, are you defensive or are you like, oh, I didn't think about that. That's interesting. You know, like how do you respond to to me potentially going deep on like, why did you do that? Like, and not necessarily like thinking I'm second guessing you, but really trying to understand like, what, what were you thinking? Um, not what were you thinking? Um, and so <laughs> um, those are important skills. Now, that's stuff that I'm looking for. Now, I think at other roles, and I think at other companies, especially, I, I think that's stuff that's important at a startup. You have small teams. You're a measurable percentage of the company. Like, every hire at a startup or an early stage company is critical. Um, I think the, the large, some of the larger organizations are places where you can go, where the soft skills matter less, and it's more about output and outcomes than it is about whatever and um and you can be a very talented technical person um and uh and not necessarily have the best soft skills um i don't want to make it seem as if like because i think there's a pretty good reputation of in in it of it people not necessarily being the easiest to work with <laughs> um and that's I, also i think where management comes in and team leads and others like play, playing defense and and sort of um you know, I I feel like I've hired plenty of people who sort of don't have the best like people skills, but they have those other qualities that I'm looking for. But um, 
but I can I can help them like if they're working with the same three or five people day in and day out the everyone will come to a shared understanding everybody's gonna if they're open-minded empathetic those types of things um but they might not be the best communicator they might be a little abrasive they might be whatever it usually it's that doesn't necessarily have to be like a career like something to be aware of um but it's not necessarily going to prevent you from succeeding in an it career um, or in a software engineering career technology career I'm but sensing there are just going to be a lot of people who want to work for you after this because you <laughs> sound like the definition of that manager we all look for. <laughs> I mean, I like to think I am. I like to think, I mean, I've, uh, I like to think I build teams and um, people like working for me. Um, that's the feedback I've gotten over my career. Um, um, so, yeah, I hope so. Um. Yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> All right, now we're going to jump to a lightning round here. A few final questions. We've obviously been talking about great experiences and great managers, but thinking of the opposite throughout your career, can you share with us your worst job or work experience that you're comfortable sharing with us today? <laughs> yeah, uh, I can. I, I alluded to it earlier. Um, uh, in terms of like just making a making a mistake in terms of, you know, I went to go work for a large financial institution. It's the nice thing is even if you look me up on LinkedIn, it's not even on my resume because I was only, I was there for less than 90 days. Um, but very quickly I realized this was not, this was not for me. Um, it's not the job that I wanted. Um, and, um, you know, I think that it was nothing about my boss, my boss was great. I, re I still remember my one-on-one -on -one with him and, you know, we went for a walk and then he, and I was like, Oh, I, this isn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. And he was like, yeah, I know. If I told you everything, you probably would, would not have taken the job. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now in his defense, uh, there were other things that were happening um, that were above my pay grade that probably had I joined a little later and all that stuff had been worked out, it would have been a much smoother, um, entry but regardless so i think that that sort of recognizing like hey this wasn't this wasn't the right move and and so on and so forth um and making you know and then having an opportunity you know and to leave and find a, a better fit um was probably one of my worst uh things but it was also still a good experience like i think any experience is a good experience if you can take a lesson away from it um and then similarly in terms of like actual like oh shit moments um i assume that's a cursing is okay. Um, you can fix it in post. Um, was I was working on a, a government. Uh, it was very much like the Obamacare of its day, but it predates that. Um, it was called the uh, Retiree Drug, Drug Subsidy Program. Um, we had ridiculous deadlines, had to get everything done. It was a um, big uh, Bush W uh, initiative. And there was a lot. And I remember the, uh, myself and the DBA uh, identified a bug that potentially could cost um, like millions of dollars to the government. Like we, like we're like, oh no, and like we, we definitely had that oh you know that oh shit moment and ran into his boss. I was it was uh, another contractor with two companies working together. So we ran into his boss's office and we're like, oh my god, Clyde, blah blah blah. You know, like we just, and he's like, and Clyde just looked at us and he's like, take a deep breath. Let me ask you this: Is anybody gonna die? And we're like, no. He's like, okay. So we got we got that set. Like, okay. So now, why don't you tell me what's going on? And I just remember how cool and calm and collected he was in that moment where uh, myself and this other, you know, the DBA were just totally out of our minds, like in panic, and him just just taking control of the moment, settling us down, and being like, all right, let's just work this through. And we fixed the bug. Um, we'd already actually fixed the bug and it was just a matter of tracking down whether or not we'd accidentally sent out any payments. And it turned out we hadn't, and it was not a big deal. Nothing happened. No, you know, it's like, you know, two engineers just having a panic attack for no, no good reason. Um, so that was definitely, I still remember that moment. I still remember standing in his office and, um, him just being like, all right, just, just settle down. Um, so yeah, anyway, so much for nice. a um, lightning round. <laughs> I think we've we've we're 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 marketing as a lightning round, but it's the it's the the, the slowest lightning uh, known to man. Um, moving on, then we ask about work life balance. Mike, how how are you balancing work and other things in your life right now? 
Uh, I mean, right now it's pretty easy because uh, I'm between things. I'm looking for new jobs <laughs> right now. It's um, the but you know, obviously, um, I think one of the things I like about startups is you have a lot of flexibility there. I think people don't think of it that way. I think people think, and I think it really varies um, from from company to company. I'll, I'll be clear on that. Um, but I like the fact that like every place I've worked has been very understanding about, hey, I have a doctor's appointment. I have to take my kid to this. I have to do this. I have to do that. And having that flexibility of like, we don't really care when the work gets done as long as the work gets done. Um, and those are the types of places I, I thrive at. Um, so it's a little more work-life integration than say, you know, I think that that's a nice balance. I think it's great to be able to um, say, hey, you know what, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm, I help coach my son's baseball team. So like four o'clock, I'm done. Um, if you need me, like get me before then or get me the next day. And, um, and so that's sort of, you know, and then the counter of that, and this is why I talk about during the interview process a lot with people is, you know, it goes both ways. Um, there's, you know, I just have a reasonableness policy. I'm reasonable with people and I expect you to be reasonable with me. Like if, if I'm giving you this flexibility to go coach your son's baseball team or, you know, on, work this set of hours, then there's going to be times when the opposite is true. And I know that for myself, there's going to be that time when, yeah, I need to put in that extra time. I need to work late because this, this, there was some unreasonable deadline that like yeah it's unreasonable just have to deal with it and um and that happens and it's just about you know the you know you sort of net it out like on the whole am i is it is this good or am i spending way too much time at work um or um and when it starts getting where it's like tw every day is a 12 hour day or a 13 hour day yeah that's a problem um but having the occasional 16 hour day it happens um but as long as you have the opposite um, and you have a flexible company that understands that, then I think it's pretty good. That's just my take. I know there's a lot of people that prefer much more structure. If you prefer a more structured environment, there's plenty of companies for that too, um, where it's, it's definitely a, more of a nine to five type job. I think that is great advice you've been sharing. Um, not just that, but that including many things you've shared. So in reflecting back on advice you've received throughout your career would you share with us some of the best advice that you've ever received as you've been navigating your career yeah i mean i think i mean the first thing that comes to mind is the thing i already said which is like when it comes to um you know some sort of incident or whatever just like put it in perspective get that perspective is anybody going to die like that's the the first thing and and by the way i worked on something where the answer to that question was yes like if we don't resolve this people could die um it was an it, you, i was uh it was a construction type project um one of the nice things about being at a startup is you get involved in lots of different things um and it, we needed to have a connection between the fire alarm and the door locks and blah 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 and since i was in responsible for infrastructure and IT that fell under me. Um, so yeah, sometimes the answer is yes. So like that basically took priority until we could figure it out. Um, so that was one of the best pieces of advice. Um, the other one, and this wasn't necessarily directly given to me, but I've, I've given it and, and others around me and have, have definitely given it, which is if you're looking to um, move up like how do you get to that next like how do you move up in an organization um do your job first and then look to do more um i think people overlook that i i can't tell you how many people i've who've reported to me or who i've mentored who are like i don't I, i'm tired of doing xyz i want more responsibility and it's like okay well you're not even doing what i'm asking you to do why am i going to give you more responsibility i understand you think that this is you know I, I would hesitate to say beneath you but like there's people who sort of get tired of doing the same thing and you know and so but yeah do your job first and then look for opportunities to do more don't and then also don't wait for your boss to come to you and say and give you opportunities um run them by say hey i noticed this needs some some somebody like or this is deficient and i was planning on working on it do you have a problem with that or whatever um so do you but make sure you're doing your job first that would be my the another yeah. piece of advice <laughs> make sure you keep your job there when you want to advance right yeah, yeah. right get, <laughs> get done. show me that you're doing what what needs to get done and that you have the room to do more the capacity yeah. to do more yep 
So now quickly on the other side, do you have any worst advice you've ever received that you could share with us? Um, worst advice? I mean, it wasn't, it's hard to say specifically, but I did have a manager who was very, very manipulative, um, recommended a book. Um, and, and the whole book is how to spot deception and in order to avoid it. But he was recommending it as like a, this is a how to manual on how to deceive and manipulate people to do your bidding. Um, and so, um, and while, uh, while that's true, like, while, um, I still remember that he was uh, a manager who put me in one of my very first management positions. He recommended me for management. And on that was when he was like, oh, you should read this book. Um, I don't believe in that style of, you know, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not that person. I don't try to manipulate people. I try to understand. And then um, so it was I would say that was some not great advice. Um, <laughs> it's hard but to say. It's, it's not really advice. Awareness. You what know, was that? Back back that <laughs> exactly. But then you mentioned you should not uh, fall for that and see right. the the benefits. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to think if I ever got any other bad advice. I'm sure I have. It's just hard. You know, you you, you of, block it out. You're right. right you try and forget that. <laughs> right. Cool. Uh, I'm looking at the clock and we're coming close to time. So I think we're getting close to wrap up. But um, you mentioned uh, one book. Have you got a book or podcast you want to recommend or, or share with our listeners today? Yeah, I'm sure this is not going to be. So one of the books um, that's recommended a lot. So I have two book recommendations. One that gets recommended a lot is called um, Staff Engineer by Will Larson. Um, gets recommended all the time. So I feel like recommending it isn't like, you know, particularly earth shattering but i definitely recommend it um for people who want to stay in that sort of technical route um another book for people who are more interested in sort of maybe management that i read um that i really really liked and i wish i'd read earlier in my career um is uh turn the ship around by um david marquette i think is the author um but it's it's a true story about a uh, a Navy captain who took the worst performing sub in the fleet and turned it into the best performing um, ship, like worst performing ship, best performing ship. Like, um, and they continued even after he left um, to be one of the best performing ships um, and really talks about um, a bottom up structure, which you don't think about in the military. Um, so, so much of what he said aligned with how i'd already started managing and sort of I w and that's why i say i sort of it would have helped me short circuit i learned a lot of the stuff the hard way and then i was like oh yeah that makes sense oh yeah and then he sort of gives reasons for why it works and and how to do it so definitely recommend that one for anyone looking into going into management <laughs> and and so you mentioned some of the learnings there uh, maybe from the from the first book what what are the sort of hot takes from from that oh hot, from staff um so I don't know. I think it's just it's not so much hot takes as much as just it really sets out. It really helps people get a better handle on what it means to be a, to be in that role, to be a, a very senior engineer without any direct reports and what the differences are. I, uh, it, it, it would be difficult to say that there's any hot takes in there. I think it's really um, just a good guide to that career path um, and helps you understand what that means. Great. We're going to Uh Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, the, the podcast, I, so I co-host a, a podcast called The Pair Program. Come check us out. Um, it's me and my co-host, Tim Winkler. Um, and we talk about startups, product, and, and technology um, at that intersection of things. Um, it's bi-weekly. So yeah, please come check us out. Awesome. Uh, well, Mike, uh, we're coming up to, I say, we're coming up to time. Um, some really great insights here. Uh, anything else you want to leave us with? I think we've got a couple of minutes. If you want, you want to give us uh, any last hot takes, any any nuggets of advice, pearls of wisdom. What are the things that you wish you knew at the start of your career? Uh, one of the things I wish I knew at the start of my career. Um, I think, yeah. So, I th one of the things that um, I've noticed, especially early in my career. Um, People, 
complaining to your peers, like it, it turn, it's like a little bit of an echo chamber, like you're on your team and you sort of know that there's these problems and you talk about it with all your cowork, like the people that are like first team on your level. Um, and so it's, you get, I think there's a lot of, especially early on in your career, you think that like nobody's listening to you and the, and it's because you're not seeing any action and it's because you're talking to the wrong people. You're not raising them up to your manager or to someone who can actually do something about it, whether, or maybe even, even if it is, if you're not really sure and you're talking to a more senior person, um, I think we early in my career, and I've seen this on teams again and again, where peers talk amongst peers and they feel like nothing's really changing. And it's like, yeah, of course nothing's changing because nobody, nobody who can do anything about it is really hearing you. Um, and you know, which is different. I mean, there's plenty of times when the opposite is true, when you've raised your concerns and nothing's changing and you feel like you're just talking to a, a brick wall. But I do challenge people to sort of step back and, and ask themselves, did I, did I really bring this up or am I just, or is this just some sort of echo chamber amongst my friends and trusted colleagues? And that's why nothing's really changing. Um, and I think one way, like a red flag to me is like, if you're sitting at your desk feeling like, oh, nobody appreciates me they'll be sorry when I'm gone type thing. Like that's a red flag. Like that means that chances are you're not talking to, to people. Um, and that's, that's not a, that's not a good headspace to be in. Um, and you're not talking to the right people. So there you go. I feel like you're very, you're, you've presented a lot throughout this of that <laughs> need to be happy where we are and do a good job, but always think about the next thing. Right. So that way we feel we have control mm -hmm. over our careers, especially in fields that might be changing or different companies or you know, startups can change direction. So I think that's really great advice, right? Do a good job where you are, mm -hmm. but you do have to constantly be proactive about the next day. It's not just going to happen for us, right? If we just sit back, we have to take that extra step and starting that early in our career, we'll just be used to it. Then we'll just keep doing it. So your old story of people keep reaching out to me. This is how I keep getting jobs, right? right. It fits that pattern. Exactly. And even within an organization, um, automating things and, and being able to create the space where you can do more, right? Like make it easy for you to move on. Like think about it as like water rising and you're the ship, that, you know, the, the, the water pushing the ship up. Like if you can, if you can make what you're doing easier, then that gives you more, you know, either you get to hand that off to other people who are earlier in their career and they can take on that responsibility and you've sort of helped someone in their career and you get to like move and advance up. And that's sort of, I would definitely like think about it in those terms. Like that's how I've moved up. It's not that I've climbed some ladder. It's that I've just sort of replaced myself from underneath um, and made it so that I can just, you know, I'm just building my platform and, and, pushing up that way awesome thanks mike uh yep. i mean i think we we expect you know we we're really excited to have with someone with a technology software engineering background on the, on the show but it's been really interesting you talk much more about the human side those soft skills and there are some of the things you maybe want to unlock in order, in order to progress in your career um thank you so much i mean mike on the job math uh, job math <laughs> i keep on calling it job math. mike on the job math podcast what is this a crossover episode i think is my um <laughs> is my bojack uh horseman reference the other day thanks so much uh i think it's gonna be a great listen for uh, would be software engineers and future engineering leaders um out there in the world um thanks so much and uh we're really looking forward to um sharing, sharing with the audience very very soon thank you yep and thank you so much for having me on here it's been a real pleasure um great talking thanks. about things Cheers, Bye. Mike. Take Bye. care. So, another one in the can, Lisa. Right. What were your... Great. We keep on saying hot takes. We're going to keep on saying hot right. takes. What are your hot takes uh, from the discussion we might today? What are your reflections? My main reflection is that people matter, right? We have to blend both of those. And even when we are a very technical person and that's our expertise, we are still working on teams. We are still interacting with other people or creating technology to be used by people. So really working on that too, right? And recognizing our strengths and weaknesses across those different areas and trying to balance them both. For you. 
Yeah, I, th I think agree with everything you've just said, but I think also I thought for people maybe uh, making their applications into organizations, maybe trying to get their foot in the door, which Mike said, you know, especially in the current climate can be a bit challenging, but make it clear, what are you going to bring to that organization? Yeah, maybe you don't have five, 10 years of experience in a given technology or different stack, whatever it may be, but it's an attitude problem solving um, skill set and, and, and uh, perspectives that we that you can sell yourself um, in, into those organizations. Yeah, one other thing I liked is he talked about the differences across different types of organizations and different opportunities. And I think that's really good to reflect as we start our career, but as we navigate it, what type of organization may be size, or is it a startup or is it more established? What, where will I thrive? What do I want to do? There are so many different types of companies where we can still do the type of job that we want. So being open-minded, but also knowing yourself in what environment you think you're going to work best in. Yeah, hundred percent. So I think we've made it to the, the end of the podcast, Lisa. We've, we've written an ending guys. So damn it, you're going to hear it. So <laughs> Lisa, why, why don't you work, uh, um, roll us out. Right. Well, first, of course, please subscribe on Spotify or YouTube and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. We'll share this and all of our wonderful episodes. Um, so even better, if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want, visit Career Badger for a bunch of additional free resources. Download the mobile app for iPhone and please try to get real human coaching from me. I would love to help you in that endeavor. So that's it from us today. See you next time.